we'll call the meeting to order. If anybody else jumps on and you may jump on. So first on the agenda is to approve the agenda. It's, um, it's kind of a lengthy one tonight, so I'll try my best to uh, keep things short and sweet. Um, but we do have quite a bit plus an executive session to get through. So, um, so we get quite a bit on our agenda tonight. I think uh, some of them are just motions. So hopefully they'll. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how long, you know, our two appointments will last. Um, the other ones seem to go pretty quick. The executive session might take a little while. Yeah. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> so we will, um, is there any, any changes or amendments to the, um, the agenda from anybody else? See a lot of heads shaking no. Okay, just need a motion to accept the agenda. Move to accept the agenda as written. Second. Okay, second, Paul, all in favor? Aye. All righty. And this evening we do have public comment first. So if there is anybody that is currently on that um, would like to bring something up that is not on the agenda, now would be the time. And then two things, you can either unmute yourself or let me get the um, message screen up or you can just throw it in the chat or if you know how to raise your hand, that's a bonus and then we can uh, call on you that way. Seeing no hands, nothing in the group chat. Okay. We will move along. I did, um, Therese, I meant to tell you when I was in today, but I, I did get several uh, positive comments this, this year in regards to the dirt roads. Um, nice. I mean, you know, mud season is what it is, but, um, you know, um, most of the comments that I have received have been positive. That's uh, good. Yeah. I talked to Alan this morning and well, you saw him there when he came by, he's, um, last week he was just tied up because right now there's only two people. It's just Alan and Hazen and well, Richard mm -hmm. to some extent and, um, Gabriel Feeney doesn't start till for sure, you know, full time till the middle of May. So Alan was tied up with crushing all last week, but their graders out this week and he's going to get Pvi, and that was pretty bad. I was out there Friday, but. Yeah, I, I think no, that's great. I'll let him know. He'll be happy. Yeah, I think early on, you know, as soon as mud season started, there were a couple of people that, you know, it's typical. I mean, you live on a dirt road and it becomes very difficult to travel it no matter what. Yeah, absolutely. But overall. Um, there was good comments this year, so that's, that's yeah. I've, I've Chris, I've all, also heard good comments about the the uh, dirt roads. Um, surprise, surprisingly, from folks that have usually generally you know had a complaint about them, uh, have made good comments about it. Uh, the only negative ones that I've heard are regarding the potholes, like on Sand Hill, yep, and a couple other places like that. But um, other than that, yeah, uh, done a good job. Yeah, the um, and I'm dealing with Sand Hill. I actually um, looking today, or I will look this week to see about renting a hot box so that we can do some patching. Obviously, that comes later in the agenda, but we, you know, it was in the packet. We didn't get the money for Sand Hill, but then um, uh, we got a call, an email from Two Rivers, and they were basically like, if you drop everything right now and submit a grant to uh, Peter Welch maybe they'll earmark the money. So I dropped everything I was doing and sent the project, including water to, um, to, you know, Welch's office and through this form and hopefully fingers crossed, you know, maybe we'll see something from there. I don't know. But in the meantime, um, right. we're obviously not going to repave Sand Hill right now, but we will deal with the potholes. And that reminds me, Chris, I was going to, I'll talk to you later. I was going to talk to you about a roller for the paving, but, um, Okay. So that's good. Well, that's good. Yeah. So I'm glad people are happy. And thank you, um, Christy, about Abbott Road. I'll let Alan know. Thanks. All right. So our first appointment, unless anybody has anything else, chip in for a uh, public comment. The um, first appointment is 6.15. So we are actually 10 minutes early. So 
Um, do, you, do you have um, uh, Leonard, Thomas, Christy, uh, Owen, David, do you have all, all the members that you uh, believe will be here this evening on or should we wait or you good to go a little early? Good to go. Okay. So I know sometimes when we move people up, there might not be somebody there yet. So, all right. So we will turn it over to you guys. Cool. Um, thank you all so much. And um, we're really excited to be here. So um, we were really grateful for the conversation that we had on the 8th and um, have brought back to our group and had some really fruitful conversations, both as a large group and our smaller um, education subcommittee. Um, and so we wanted to, this is basically a proposal about the proposal. <laughs> so we, um, we kind of wanted to set out a timeline. Um, and I think I'll just sort of speak for the majority of what we discussed is that um, I think something that this equity and inclusion committee is wanting to do is wanting to be in conversation with y'all. And so I think we're kind of wanting to position ourselves less as experts in um, this work and more like partners to the board. Um, so we really want to have conversations that are about um, questions that you have, questions that we have, um, just really learn with each other and learn together. And we really think that through conversation is part of how we, we talk about and really model equity in our community. Um, and so this proposal is to do a couple of things. First, um, we really hope that y'all will take some time to read this essay, that um, very short essay that um, Jerry Thomas, who's not on the call tonight because he was working, um, wrote. And this is something that he originally wrote um, for um, some work he was doing at, at Vermont Law School, um, but he modified it for the select board. And um, this is talking specifically about um, the concept of colorblindness. Um, and one of the things that we were hoping could happen is that uh, we understand the restrictions of open meeting laws. And we also understand that y'all have really busy schedules and are doing a lot of things. Um, and so we were hoping that y'all could pair in, in pairs with each other um, to talk about this essay and, um, and sort of start doing that just internal conversations with each other. And we are offering that as sort of a, a first thing to talk about. Um, and it's written by someone that lives in our town um, and someone who this issue is really um, something that he's been thinking and working on for a long time. Um, we had some ideas about pairings and um, this is in our proposal. So we thought um, that Chris and Paul, Dave and Jean, Lindley and Therese could be the pairings. Um, and um, I don't exactly know how we came to these pairings. I know that Dave and Jean, part of that was because y'all are neighbors. <laughs> um, so I really think that it could be whatever you want. The idea is that conversations are happening about this and that we want to be um, facilitating conversations. So that's sort of the next proposal is that we would have um, a series of conversations amongst each other. Um, and this is, uh, the proposal is to do circles and circles are um, a type of facilitated conversation that is used a lot in our school system. And I'm sure Jamie could speak to it um, later on, but it's used in what's called restorative justice models. Um, and it's uh, used to address um, conflict, but it's also used as a way to have conversations and kind of step into brave spaces together um, with like a really clear model for how those conversations happen to make sure that everybody has a time to speak and that everybody um, can actively listen. 
And one of the reasons why we thought this would be a great way to um, start having conversations with each other, um, less as us being experts, but more as all of us being experts in different ways in our lives and just actually talking about this stuff is what we wanna be doing. That's a goal of ours as a committee. Um, that this would be a way that we could also be modeling um, you know, the same types of things that our students are learning about how to have these types of conversations, um, both when there's conflict and when there's not, to prevent conflict and to just grow stronger together. Um, so we thought that that could happen between now and the end of May. Um, and then we were also hoping that um, we, I don't know if this is a formal proposal or how this even happens, but we'd like to have a gallery exhibit um, that honors the history of our town um, coming together and coming out to support um, the life of George Floyd and other um, Black people um, who uh, were, have been murdered in our country. Um, and the organizing that happened last summer that I will give a shout out to David Fair um, as one of the key organizers of that. Um, and there's a person named Nick Keating, who's a professional photographer, and he happened to, he didn't happen to, we invited him to <laughs> the March and Rally, and he took beautiful photos, high resolution professional photos of this time. Um, and we thought it would be a really beautiful way one year later, especially during the Derek Chauvin trial that's happening right now, to honor the fact that this happened and to celebrate the fact that even if folks have differing opinions about that moment, it is a part of Bethel's history that we did this um, and that over 300 people attended. Um, and it was a really beautiful day and the state police actually were strong supporters of it um, and supported the march and also supported an action at state police headquarters at the Royalton Barracks at the end. So we thought that introducing art and introducing celebration um, as part of our committee's work um, is something that we'd really love town support on. And we think it would mean a lot to have the select board saying, yes, we want to honor this history. Um, so those are our proposals for kind of first steps. And um, we, we can either answer questions now, or as we said, um, we're happy to you know, give you all some time to marinate on it or ask questions amongst yourselves and in your pairs if you decide you want to pair. Um, and that's it. I can answer about town hall, Chris. Um, there's a form, Owen, just reach out to Kelly okay. about town hall because she keeps track of who books it when. And okay. um, we'd have to, you know, if that, obviously you can't hang anything on the walls in there because it's town hall and it obviously has plaster and all that sort of stuff. So they had talked at one point up the historical society about hanging up these kind of rails to hang pictures from. Mm -hmm. Not sure it ever got done, um, but you know, there's a policy about renting town hall. So if you just email her, she can send you the form and all that. Okay, okay. I know that um, Susie and Greg had figured out a way to um, hang stuff on the walls for their art shows. Mm -hmm. So if there aren't any railings up, then you could talk to probably talk to Susie and Greg about how they manage that because they they definitely did that a couple times a year, I think. It's okay, a that's, rail right. System. that's right. I forgot about that. What was that, Lindley? It it is a rail system, but it's only in the conference room. There isn't so if you wanted the main okay. hall in town hall, oh. I don't think it exists okay. there yet. Okay. Maybe they're open to that. I don't know. Yeah. But you could use um, the da the conference room, which is actually nice, Owen, because it's right on one level. So mm -hmm. when people kind of come in the main, you know, entrance, it's, you know, when you walk in the downstairs door, conference room is right in the back. And it's actually a pretty good size room. So okay. that might work. You could scope it out. Yeah, we could get creative. We could do easels. We could do all sorts of things. Um, yeah, and because it has the lobby too. Yeah, so um, just reach out to Kelly and and certainly someone can meet you there, Kelly or myself or something, just to show you the space too. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And I did forget um, that our, our committee is also working on some um, definitions, um, just some language. And we're uh, to full transparency, we're doing this work with you, right? We're, we're, we're having conversations internally about what do we think about this language? You know, how do we agree on these terms? Like who decides what 
equity means, right? And so we're actually, as a group, trying to figure that out as well. We'd love to do that in partnership with you, but we did want to let you know that we're coming up with some working definitions and stuff that we hope to share with you very soon as well, I forgot to mention. Yeah, I had met with Jerry and Christy and Owen for, I don't know, hour, hour and a half, a couple of weeks ago, and, and they were great. And that's kind of, we had talked about that too, common language and, and things. And, and after, you know, they were great, answered my questions and, you know, didn't make me feel like an idiot. And, you know, it was all, it was good. So um, I appreciated their time as well. So. So I just wanted to say um, to the committee, thank you for um, providing us with with the literature that you did. Um, and I was I was reading that this weekend as well as just kind of thumbing through the notes of um, our other visits. And and then I was going back and looking at some of the, uh, the well, I mean, even though the meeting minutes at the committee meetings, it's way different than actually being at the committee because you only just get to see you know broad topic, you don't, you don't get to find out all the finite discussion. Um, but one thing that kind of came out to me that, that I had written down from the first meeting that we had last year, and I didn't see anything, and maybe it's just because the meeting minutes didn't cover it at some point. Um, so I, the question I had was, I know we had talked about last year of uh, putting together uh, like a local survey uh, of um, you know of our Bethel community on, on 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 the topics and I didn't know from reading through things I didn't see anything in there I mentioned at the committee level so so is the committee right now are they looking at that or are you in the process of doing it or yeah <clears throat> um, yes so that's something we want to do we have been um we reached out to the bethel historical society because we kind of thought we could um whatever the non hurtful thing is kill two birds with one stone a different way of saying that but we thought what we could do is if we are going to be doing some type of reach out to everybody um it would be a great time to also redo the bethel phone book um and i've actually been in conversation with greg and susie fedek about redoing that phone book for a while. Um, and so we thought that would be a great way to invite people like, do you want to participate in this survey? And also, is this your correct phone number <laughs> that you want in that? Um, however, Greg and Susie are going through a lot right now. Um, and so they asked that we contact them again in June. So we've kind of put a pause on that. We'd love to collaborate with them and collaborate with other committees in general. Um, and from that, I think we want it to be um, we want it to be pretty um, open ended. So not really leading people in any particular way, but just um, asking, you know, um, like how is your experience? Um, are there things that you'd like our committee to do? Are there things we need to know about? Um, and we've already heard from feedback, both positive and negative, and it's been really helpful to answer questions about what we're actually doing and what we're about. Um, but I do want to do that. I think we all want to do that in a more structured way. And because there's this phone book already, it seems like there's at least some kind of process for how to contact everybody. But um, Susie was just like, you don't even know what you're getting into, Owen. Like, it's going to be a mess. Um, <laughs> so, but yes, we would like to do that. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and it's always easier to, you know, understand, you know, on whatever topic that that anybody's doing is, you know, where is your baseline and totally. yeah. um, establishing that baseline because I'd hate to see, you know, a lot of work put into something that maybe maybe isn't affecting the local community as much as we think it may. Um, so that that was the only thing, and I I know from having done a survey years ago, there's a lot of work that goes into it. It's not. It's not as easy as you think, like you just like pass it out there. I mean, it's, there's a lot of thought going into the topics of discussion and, and then there's distributing it and getting it to um, everybody and then receiving it and then categorizing it. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to it, you know, it might take a year to do it, but um, I just had, I had that written down when I was looking at it. I don't know if any of the other board members had any other questions, but that was uh, one question that I couldn't find um, that we had talked about last year. So,
No, I would say overall, I like your proposal. I think it's a good starting place for us as individuals to do some learning, but then also to kind of come back in small groups in, in ways where we're not breaking the law <laughs> to, uh, to then sort of help each other further that. Um, I'm kind of curious what other what other board members think about the proposal itself. I had been in the meeting where you discussed it, so I sort of had a little bit of a heads up um, and had some time to think about it more than just reading the packet. Um, I know that when I when I had sat through the meeting be before we heard the proposal formally, my only big concern was um, just the amount of time commitment it would be, and it it feels it, it feels appropriate. It doesn't feel overly lofty um, and sort of recognizing that everyone might end up at different places than the ideal, but sort of having an ideal to aim for and trying to meet that goal. So I'd, I'd love to hear what other board members think. Yeah, and, and I would agree with Lindley. Um, I, I think the only challenge for myself is the way my business um, works is, you know, spring, summer, and fall, we are like 24 um, seven. You know, I don't, I'm not one of those people that's like, I work 60 hours this week because you're working like, you know, emails at 12 o'clock at night. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, so this time of year for me is very hectic. Um, my time um, is, you know, between my kids and this is like, I'm like maxed. Um, winter time, wide open. Like I, you know, have all kinds of time. So um, I, I think there's way of doing it. It may not be exactly the way it's you know has been put out here but I think there's a way to have you know um, to read literature and to talk about it either amongst ourselves or you know um, to do that I don't know if I can you know say I can devote x amount of hours per session doing it but I think you know there's probably a way that we can do it um, uh, you know and make it work um, so I guess that's kind of where I'm at uh, with it I have a question, Owen. What are you going to do, or have you thought about the possibility that there are going to be folks that are going to be not celebrating George Floyd? So, to, are we going to be able? Are we going to talk equally about both sides of this coin? That's a great question. Um, I think for the vision of this um, of this gallery opening is less to um, is, is more about celebrating the fact that our town came together and did this big event together in partnership with a bunch of different community members, businesses, and the state police. So it was really sort of like all of us coming together. Um, we are thinking maybe if it is a gallery opening um, and we haven't talked about this um, fully, but um, you know, it'd be great to have some of the people involved speak. And um, I would defer to David as the organizer, um, but you know, perhaps that would even mean um, superintendent um, of the state police speaking as well, right? Because she was very involved and very supportive. Um, so I think instead of sort of getting into um, how people feel about any individual person, it would be more about acknowledging the fact that our town did this and, um, and really just like celebrating that as, as something we all did together, um, if that answers your question. Well, it, it kind of does, but you're, uh, I'm, yeah. It's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a tough one because while you had three hundred people there, they were not all from Bethel. Right. There are nineteen hundred people in Bethel, um, and walking the streets, I hear other comments that are not necessarily positive. So uh, while I'm getting educated here, I feel that I should be educated well rounded. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I guess we'll have to see how that goes. And as yeah. far as timing, I've worked for 58 years and I planned on taking some time off this summer. Mm. So I will do what I can, but 
I'm going to be in Montana for a month and I'm going to be in Rhode Island for two weeks. So we'll have to work around that. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and I hope that our committee can become a resource for those conversations. Like I said, I personally have received and had some really productive, what I thought productive dialogues, because I think part of what the equity and inclusion committee is really about is that this town is a place for all of us. We don't all need to agree about anything. <laughs> and that's not the expectation of what our committee does. Um, so I think we would really welcome to be in dialogue um, about, you know, how people feel about this. That's what we want to do. How do people feel about the, the issues that are happening in our town, in our state, and in our country, and being a resource around that. But totally heard about the time commitment as well. Um, and yeah, we're willing to work with y'all, however that needs to happen. I I also have been thinking about it a little bit, and while the national scene has a lot of uh, high-profile ha happenings, uh, when I when I asked for education, I think I was I know I was more looking for what's going on here, what's going on next door, what am I what am I uh, perceived or what am I not knowingly doing that. Uh, I should look at more closely mm. because I'm not going to see, I'm not going to do anything about what's going on in Los Angeles or Minnesota or Washington, DC or Florida or wherever. Mm -hmm. I'm, if I'm going to do anything, it's going to be right here in Bethel, Vermont. Yeah. So I need to ed be educated on what's, what's not happening in Bethel, Vermont or what is happening that whatever. Yeah. So I'm hoping that this education will, will drift that way at least partially. Yeah, totally. Yes, Dave. And that's what we want to do with these conversations. We want it to really be neighbor to neighbor, folks from Bethel talking about Bethel um, and really kind of getting to know each other and, and kind of getting past like all of the other noise, right? And just really talking about each other and getting really, it's about relationship building is what it is. But also at the same time, we need to un be understanding of how the um, situations around the country are affecting the people in this town and making some of us feel because just because it's not here doesn't mean it's not affecting us at the same time. But I do agree with you, Dave, and we do need to worry about what's going on here. Right, well, that's what I said. What, what, what does it do? Even though I, I don't, I'm not going to do anything about the national stuff. What has the national stuff done to the people in Bethel? To their, I woke, I woke their up every day. I woke up every day last year watching the news, crying every morning, every day for probably a good three months straight, because another black man got killed, another civilian was killed by an officer. Yeah, it affected me very closely. They like. Honestly, in a way that a lot of things have never affected me ever. I've never been affected the same way that I was last year. And that's from the bottom of my heart. That What, what happened last year was insane. And it, it, I literally woke up in tears every morning. Well, I think definitely, um, you know, Dave brings, brings up some good points. And I, you know, it's obviously this... This isn't, uh, you know, easy subjects to talk about because if it was easy, then we would have everything by now, right? Um, you know, I think we have to, you know, not to take away from anything that's happening nationally, but I, I do understand, you know, my perspective more is too, I can't control what happens in Boston, but I can sort of control what happens in Bethel or maybe Randolph or, you know, my community, you know, community areas. And, you know, how does that, and, and I guess I'm a little bit on board with Dave when it comes to like education wise is, you know, ha, you know, like David was just pointing out, you know, knowing some of these um, or educations on how it is affecting um, our citizens of our town, right? You know, how does that affect David when he sees what's happening nationally? Or, or how does that not affect David when he sees something nationally? You know what I mean? So I'm just, you know, I, I think that's, when I talk about like the baseline and 
you know, uh, some sort of survey or something, but, you know, how, how are people in Bethel feeling, you know, um, and try to keep, you know, uh, I know there's always people trying to tell us how we're supposed to feel, but how are we feeling, you know, I mean, you know, and how can we use the tools that we have and, and education to help our um, citizens of Bethel. And I saw, uh, Gene, you had your hand up, I believe. Yeah, uh, the, we, this is not Bethel specific, but it is nearby specific in that it is Vermont. We have recently seen a select board member threatened uh, because of her race. We have seen a state senator threatened and forced to resign because of her race here in Vermont. We have seen uh, a town report that had a very controversial cover uh, saying if you don't, basically, if you don't like it here, go someplace else, uh, expressing a, a, some um, anxiety uh, that many of us who are, quote, flatlanders uh, may not feel as welcomed by Vermont and may not feel as welcomed here in Bethel uh, as uh, others. There is, a, uh, there, there is an underlying uh, part of our state uh, that tends to not be as welcoming and inclusive as uh, we would like to think we are or that we want to be. And so I think part of that's, and part of my, that's part of my response, Dave, to your question, uh, we need to, in my view, uh, be able to say out loud and be able to have the, con the hard conversations, what does it mean to belong to a community? What does it mean to be a Vermonter? Uh, and, and how do we talk about that? It may be that we need to take uh, a look at issues that are national in scope uh, and ask ourselves, how do we in a predominantly uh, monochromatic <laughs> community in, in state, uh, how do we, uh, respond to uh, the issues that are that have gone unnoticed to for too long in our own communities. Uh, that's just part of my response is that we need to be aware that yes, there are, we want to include everybody, but everybody's got to be in the conversation. And one of the ways to be in the conversation is to, to say, this is going on all around us and it's going around here. Uh, and it may not be uh, simply related to color. It may also be related to ethnicity, language that you speak. Are you Hispanic? Uh, are you welcomed? Uh, how do we react uh, to uh, migrant workers or Hispanics in our community? All kinds of, uh, of issues that come up. Uh, I think those are, they are hard conversations and we need to be able to, to talk about them. Even with those where we might traditionally think we are across the table or across the aisle or across a chasm that is unbridgeable. I think we need to find a way to bridge the chasm and, and engage people who want to engage. And some people are not going to want to engage no matter what. Uh, and so we put it out there and, and see what 
see what we can do. Well, I obviously don't want to cut off our conversation, <clears throat> um, but I probably will give it like another 10 minutes because um, we do have another appointment coming up. Um, so if we have any other comments in regards to, I see Leonard's hands are up. Um, thank you, Gene, for, for that uh, comment. I really appreciate that. And Dave, I appreciate your comment as well. And I totally agree with you that we need to mainly focus on Bethel. But at the same time, I believe Bethel is not an island. We live in a state and in this state is in a country that uh, has a lot of uh, problems with uh, uh, black lives and with minority lives. Just today, another kid in Minnesota got killed by a police officer. So you can hardly open any kind of news or, or anything without seeing this. And Personally, it doesn't affect me firsthand, but it affects me. And because I see what's going on, what's going around. And I think that's that's the conversation we need to have. And you can't really separate that completely from Bethel or, or from, from us here, because then we could also say, well, I live in my own house and nothing is happening in my own house. So why do I need to worry about anything that's happening in my mm -hmm. town, in the community? You got something? Basically, um, what I want to say is seeing anybody brutally, unnecessarily murdered, black, white, green, or otherwise in the street, uh, in, a, in a country of liberty and equality, affects everybody. One way or the other, it affects us all, no matter where we live. So if it happens in New York and I live in Bethel, it affects all of us, but I want to know what Bethel feels about it and what they're doing about it, but we can't separate Bethel out from America. Without America, there would be no Bethel that we live in. That's all I want to say to that. And I think that we are impacted. We're also impacted because there are conversations in Vermont about use of force by uh, police officers, what is appropriate, what is not appropriate. There are conversations in Vermont about the housing of criminals, whether that is something that we farm out to uh, uh, for-profit corporations in Mississippi or anywhere else, or whether we, quote, take care of our own. Uh, there are all kinds of questions uh, that that are not exclusive <laughs> to Minnesota or these other hot button, hot topic places. They do affect us all. I my concern is uh, carving out two hour blocks. I understand that. But I also uh, would, would welcome, um, and I welcome the idea of pairing, but I would also like to see the possibility of select board members being paired in a variety of ways and not just, you know, Dave and I, nothing, I think Dave and I should be paired, but I also think Chris and I should be paired and then so that it's, it's not just a two here and two there and, and so on. So I don't know how we might uh, uh, think about that. Um, Just to add to that, I hope you, some of you, I don't know if you're aware, there are people who have a problem with the policing in Bethel and what happens to minorities in Bethel. So that's something we should think about as well in this conversation. I actually have a perfect example of that. I got out of work today and was walking to the hospital because my stepdaughters had orthopedic appointments and 
I got one sheriff that drove by me and turned around and drove by me again. Mind you, I'm in my work uniform. I have my work bag on. And then uh, a state trooper circled around and did the same thing. And then another sheriff, the same, guess what? My heart was beating a million miles a minute. I had no idea what was going, what was going to happen. And you wonder why or how the things that are going on in the country affect us. I was scared. I was scared in the middle of downtown Randolph that I could very well be another statistic. Simply based on the way that I dress. That, that is what I, I, not what I wanted to hear, but the, but the, uh, <laughs> but that's what you mean. of being, uh, that's happening here, here near my home. And that, that is troubling. Um, I don't know what to say, uh, other than that, that's, when I talked about education, that's what I wanted to hear is what's going on around here. And apparently it's uh, similar. So uh, I guess we need to talk, we, meaning all of us Vermonters need to talk about it. Um, in regards to local policing, you know, Lenny, if there's ever an issue with the local police, meaning obviously we have two constables, Justin and Oscar. Um, so if there's ever an issue locally, you know, I, I want to hear about that. Uh, if there's any issue with um, with that, I, I, you know, would like to know about that so we can address it immediately. And I just wanted to say thank you and thank you to everybody who's shared. Um, these are exactly the types of conversations our committee wants to be having. So Dave, Eddie, like, thank you, bud. And like, thank you for, um, Thank you for being willing to step into that and ask the question, what's going on here? Our hope is that in these small circles, we can have more dialogue like this. And hopefully you can understand that these aren't comfortable conversations for any of us. <laughs> um, it's not comfortable to experience this. Um, and so part of what the idea of the circles is, is to create a little bit of a container where there can be um, the conversations can go a little bit deeper with each other and the questions can be deeper as well. So we look forward to next week answering any more questions you have. Um, and thank you so much for your time. That's what I wanted to ask the board about. Um, does, do you, is that enough time for the equity and, you know, for people to come back, for them to come back? It, we're meeting back to back because of my uh, request to go on vacation next on the last week in April. So I'm not sure, you know, does that, I'm, I wonder, Owen, you know, does the select board, how do they feel about that? Does that give you, do you want to wait and meet in a little bit later? I, I will speak up in the fact, on only the fact that my main client, which I'm trying to let me retire, but they're not, had a, a major failure and I am going to be back working full time for probably the next seven to nine days. So I'm not going to have any time to meet with Gene between now and next Monday. There's, I just can't. When's our next board meeting after that one, Therese? Uh, I knew you're going to say that. I was just one. grabbing my phone here to look. I know. I'm just going to The 10th of May. Does that sound right? I think so. Hang on. I got my calendar here too. April. Yep. Yeah. 10th? That's right. Yeah, May 10th. Maybe we should move them to May 10th. That would have a, you know, I don't want to waste, you know, the equity inclusion committee's time. Obviously, time's valuable for everybody. Maybe that would give people more of a chance to have certainly read Jerry's um, essay and to have done any other, you know, reading of their own. It seems like he joined, he, he listed some other sites and references and things that people can look up on the internet and stuff. I, I will speak to that essay in the fact that I did take the time to read it. And uh, that brought out a couple things that I really hadn't thought about. Uh, so yeah, that, that definitely starts another conversation. Okay. 
I would encourage us to continue, well, to say, well, here's what I would say. I would be willing to commit to, to meeting with Dave or talking with Dave about the essay, whether it gets, it's not gonna get done by next week. But I would also be willing to commit to the committee that we could continue tonight's conversation next week after we've all had a chance to, uh, to let it simmer uh, and, and see how the second phase or these two uh, this circle conversations uh, might be held and whether they might be held by the end of May so that uh, we could maybe, I'd be willing to commit to the first step and then to continue the conversation about the second step sooner rather than later so we don't keep putting it off but that's chris i see lily has her hand up sorry lily i didn't see you you weren't you weren't part of my um the brady bunch screen at that point <laughs> because i get to see nine blocks right now <laughs> Is it okay if I ask a quick question and follow up to the EIC? Sure. Um, I'm a huge believer in community conversation. It's a lot of the professional work I do, and I think it's really important. And I love what you're saying about these sorts of conversations with the select board. Are you thinking as a, a town committee about larger community conversations? Is that part of this work for you kind of in this phase of how um, this iteration of it as well? Um, thank you, Lily. Um, yes, totally. So in our sort of like charging documents, um, our first um, sort of the first tier is that we really want to work with the, the select board and with um, town committees of the select board. But I think absolutely this is something that we want to do. And we're thinking about all different ways, like maybe we can have you know, some sort of regular conversations over the summer. Maybe we can do some like movie screenings with like parent shares afterwards. Like we're definitely bubbling with ideas, um, but we really wanted to meet the goal of supporting the select board um, first. So yeah, and we'd be super jazzed to partner on anything, any ideas you have. Awesome, great, thanks for sharing. I look forward to learning more. Yeah. All right. So Chris, so let's see. So you heard from Dave and Jean, uh, but Paul and Lindley, I'm not sure. So do they, do you want to? Well, I, I think I'll jump in just for a quick second. I haven't had a lot of comments. Um, I'm still in the marinating phase. Um, I like to get all my ducks in the row before I speak on something. And I, I really just got to read the essay and everything yesterday. So I haven't really had a chance to form firm thoughts. I do agree with a lot of what's been said tonight. I think there needs to be an emphasis on the community conversation and outreach to the community. Um, I think that I, we need a little more time to do it. Um, I know Chris's schedule is pretty, pretty well packed. Mine is getting more packed every moment the phone rings. Um, so I think taking a little more time to be able to digest the essay and and formulate some concrete thoughts um, would would uh, would be better for me anyway. Oh, how did I get partnered up with Paul? <laughs> Just lucky, I guess. <laughs> Can you read you on that? I'll meet you at the fire station. We'll have a <laughs> nice come, nice comeback, Paul. So, what about Lindley? Um, so, what do you think about next week versus the tenth? I'm honestly flexible on either. I, I have read the essay. I actually made a point to read it twice just to really absorb it a bit more. And I would probably read it again uh, beforehand. But I, I, I feel like some of the folks that maybe want some more time that I can defer to that, that works for me. That was not a real answer, guys. Not really. I was thinking that. <laughs> she's a true politician. My gosh, she's good, isn't she? So it looks like um, Dave would like a little more time. Paul would like a little more time. Um, Jean's okay. Lindley 
is good to go. So um, I just know, um, I, I'm trying to think about what's on the agenda for next Monday. So what's the, cause I mean, you could do, you could do it instead of having, you know, I'd book them for 15 minutes, which, so we could do a sh making sure we stick to the 15 minutes next time, or we could book them for 30 minutes on the 10th. I, you know, yeah. I can go anywhere. I'm just the keeper of the calendar. I mean, I, I think I personally would rather wait until the May 10th meeting. And the only reason why I say that is our schedule is a little messed up with Usually we have two weeks to kind of prepare for our next board meeting. Yep. Uh, in this case, we only have one week, but we also have another meeting to prepare for, which is a joint meeting with the right. Royalton board the very next day. Yes. Not to mention everything else that we do in our normal lives. Right. That's right. Um, I, I think, it. you know, I would be better prepared myself for the 10th than I would be, uh, or I'll back up. I'll probably be able to share more. Um, and have more attention on the 10th than I would um, trying to cram this in in one week. Yeah, Lindley. All right. I have more of an opinion now. Ready? <laughs> um, I would say let's go with the 10th, but um, sort of twofold. So I think that the essay is great, but could we maybe ask the EIC? And it doesn't have to be, this does not have to be like the full perfect glossary of terms, but maybe give us a couple starter terms and do it. Uh, like it's maybe lofty to ask because I know your next meeting is next Monday. So, but like give us a, a full week with that information. Cause I think what part of the problem is, is we get our packets on Friday and then we have between Friday night and Monday night to read them. Mm -hmm. And so then it's the reading and absorbing time. That's sort of what we're hinging on here. And so if we could have like a little bit more to go on and then in return, we would be, our homework would be coming up with our dates with our paired person and knowing those those dates that we could give you guys. So for your meetings, you could actually come to May 10th meeting with, okay, here's who you, your pair will work with this person. And so like we could help each other if we're gonna push it to the 10th, we can still be doing some work outside of this time. Um, and I can, if it helps, I can write that thought out a little bit more succinctly than I said it, but just to kind of give you guys a little homework, us a little homework, so then we're coming to the May 10th meeting a little more prepared from both sides than just uh, giving ourselves three weeks between now and then and doing nothing more than we've already done. I think that's a good point. I like the idea of having, you know, even if it's a couple of, of the terms of definitions, I think that's a good idea. Like you said, it doesn't have to be every single one, but there's obviously some main um, you know, to, we can't, I, I feel like in order for us to have the right conversation, we need to be using the same language and, and understanding what it means. So I think, yeah, I think you're right. Even if it was just three or four terms that are very common that, you know, would be fine to focus on. So you don't have to feel like, oh, and you got to kick out 50 definitions, you know, why <laughs> like just, you know, you don't have to do 50, you know, you could just do like, you know, some 40, 49 would be good. That's right. <laughs> And, you know, have some time to do it. But I think Lindley's right. And that's what I had said to Owen and Christy and Jerry in an email was, hey, you know, Owen was like, you know, when can I get the stuff to you? And I'm like, I need to, I try to kick the packets out by Friday at noon. And, and it is, it's tight for people to, you know, to read, you know. Case, I'm we'll make sure. a, so if I, he, if I heard you right, Lindley, you'd like to have the information for the May 10th meeting in your packet for our meeting that is next week. Not necessarily just the, oh, okay. so the additional, you know, what, whatever the EIC decides to come up with, and, and I wouldn't make it a lofty goal, just something small, like Therese was saying, like a handful of terms that give us a good starting place. But I don't know, because they don't meet until next Monday anyway, so I'd want to give them some time. To oh, gotcha. Okay. Together. But I'm assuming that could be emailed to us, like they could get it to Therese and she could email it yeah. to us in the <clears throat> last week of April or you're on okay. the first week of May. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and could you do that? Gotcha. If you could get them to me by the first week in May or the last week in April, first week in May, I can get them to the select board so that they have some time to mull it over and ask, you know, kind of make a list of their own questions based on that. So if you could get them to me at the beginning of May, that first week, and I'll be gone the last week in April. So, so if you did it the first week in May, I could get it to the select board. So hopefully they'd have five, seven days to digest this. That sounds good. Um, and I'm hope Christy and Dave 
do you think that's good? Yeah, I think that should be fine. Yeah. But I did hear something that I think would be great to just say out loud too. Um, just because Owen made suggested pairings for the May 10, like I'm hearing that Lindley and Jean, they're prepared to pair up now. Why couldn't you hang out together? Huh? Why not? Yeah. Right? So I'm just saying. Bail on Therese. <laughs> just what? saying. I can't bail on Therese. Uh, all right. I could pick up, well, I could get one of somebody else, or I still could meet with you too. So I think. Yeah, you still could meet. I think everybody's schedule, right, is, is sometimes our schedules are more compatible with a different person. So I'm here, right? Everybody's an adult. They could pair up with somebody else. And and as Jean had suggested, if people do multiple pairings, then so be it. Can I just say one thing? Because I know that we're about, you guys are about to move on. Um, I feel like a lot of times when it comes to the EIC, it tends to become a focus of race. Um, but I also feel as a member of that committee, it's my obligation to also point out that a lot of the local acts aren't necessarily pointed towards black people or people of color, but towards gay and transgender community, um, who literally have done a lot for this community and in return, they get bashed day in, day out. They literally, and they do nothing but try to bring this town together. So I don't really think you need to look that far to see the hate that does live in Vermont. And I'm gonna leave it on that. All right. So again, you know, we thank you all for attending this evening and um, we look forward to our discussion on the 10th. Um, you know, feel free to, you know, you guys are always welcome to reach out to us individually. We're always available um, or seen throughout the community. We're always around somewhere. So um, I don't just think that you have to reach out during the meeting time. So, um, but again, thank you this evening. Um, fortunately, we got to get, uh, Therese put together quite the long list for us this evening. Um, she wanted to make sure that Dave stayed up later tonight. Okay. So, <laughs> but we thank you all for attending this evening and thank you all. All right. So, um, so at some point, Jamie will be uh, jumping on. <clears throat> Um, to talk to us in regards to um, school. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to hammer out as many of the other agenda items as we can. And I'll just, um, I'll try to keep an eye on as well as you, Therese, if you see Jamie pop on, we'll just, uh, yep. we'll try to just, you know, come end where we're at. Um, okay. And I just checked my email just to make sure he hadn't emailed sure. me. Sure find the link but I don't see him. Okay. So. Okay. So we'll um it looks like probably a bunch of these we can kind of go through kind of quickly. <clears throat> I tried to set them up so that you could um Okay. You know, get through them. So we just have um a couple of different appointments, uh resignation uh, to go through. So the first one, uh Cindy Metcalf um in regards to appointing for the emergency shelter director. Yep. Uh, we're talking about having a new shelter director and- Yep, she spoke and, with Paul and she picked up the box of forms today to take a look at that. And so she's gonna go through that information and you know, talk, she wants to reach out to all the existing volunteers and see what, mm -hmm. people, you know, see how much time people spend. And so I mean, obviously Cindy was excellent uh, during COVID and so helpful, especially with the Vermont Strong and, you know, she maintains that website and she'd obviously be a tremendous asset um, as the emergency shelter director. Yeah. So unless anybody has any comments, um, all I need is a motion to a point. So moved. Second. Moved by Paul and second by Lindley. So all in favor? Uh, moved by Dave. Oh, moved by Dave? Yeah. Okay. 
and then second by Lindley. So you're all set. Did you get that, Lisa? Now I confused everybody. <laughs> People are changing. My boxes and my um, my squares are changing. So I think somebody's on the right now. They're on the left, and I'm like, where? Where? We just lost Lisa. No, nope, people are on the left. <laughs> I don't know why it keeps changing. Maybe somebody left. Uh, and then we had <clears throat> uh, Penny Griffin. Uh, we had talked about last time in regards to uh, potentially for the the solid waste uh, board, which um, she has now put her letter of interest in. So um, we just do need we need to act on that last one first. We need to vote. We had a, mo a motion. A mo it was moved and seconded. Do yeah, we need to vote? Yeah, that I asked all in favor. <laughs> yep. I, again, <laughs> I saw one thumb up. So then at that point, we had three. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so we had Penny Griffin in regards to the solid waste board. So I just need a motion to appoint Penny. So moved. I'll second. Okay, Paul and Lindley. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All right. So just a quick note, that meeting with the Ralden board is definitely on the 20th. It's on the 21st. It's oh, it is the 21st? Yeah, it says that in your town manager's report. It's uh, the 21st at 6.30. Oh, okay. Um, uh, which, what day of the week is that one? Wednesday. It's the Wednesday. Oh, it is Wednesday. Okay, because last time I talked to you, it seemed like we were going Tuesday on that one. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, it, no, it is. It's Tuesday, oh. April 21st. I think they gave us two choices, right? Tuesday, oh, no. 20th. What? 21st is no, Wednesday. I'm confused. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Wednesday. I'm sorry. So it is Wednesday the 21st. So sorry. <laughs> well, I had five people. I'm trying to figure out who works better the 20 the 21st, but it was the 21st that worked the best for the most. Okay. So sorry. Oh. I was the 21st out. at what time? 6.30 at the Bethel Town Hall. We're going to be in person, but we're going to obviously socially distance. Okay. And I had told them that we would do the agenda, so we'll get to that later tonight. Okay. Um, just to let you all know, I'm going to be teaching that day in Waitsfield, so I'll, I'll scoot over the mountain as fast as I can, but I may be a little bit late just because I teach right up until about 5 or 5.30. Yeah. If I was you, Lindley, I'd drive slow. I feel like as a new board member, it'd be really good. Then you will have to worry about it. <laughs> drive really slow. <laughs> All right. And then we had uh, Chris Fors, uh I believe it's a reappointment to the Conservation Commission for three years. Does that sound right, Chris? It did. Yeah, it didn't yeah, reappointment. Yeah, reappointment. reappointment. So moved. So moved by Lindley. Second. Second by Gene. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. <clears throat> Chris is staying with the Conservation Commission. And then we did have a resignation. Um, so uh, Tristan Brown's resignation from the Equity and Inclusion Committee. So we just need. Um, I know you don't normally, you don't have to do motions to accept resignations, but I kind of like doing it so that it's in the records. So when we have sure. to go back, we kind of have a clear record of it. So if we deny it, then that may means they have to stay on. Yeah, right. If you wish. <laughs> so is that how it goes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how'd, you, how'd you know? You can send a letter. We're sorry to inform you that your resignation did not go through last night. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> That'd be pretty funny. All right. So, uh, did we have someone move that one? Move to accept the resignation. Okay. Paul moved. Second. Second, Lindley. All in favor? Aye. All right. That's what's going to happen to you, Lindley, you and Dave, when you try to get off the uh, solid waste board. We're going to say, nope, not happening. <laughs> All right. And then we had, still looking, don't see anything. Don't nope. see anything, about Jamie. Um, so we had revolving loan fund. 
Yes, it's a modification agreement. They'd had a balloon payment due, and then they approached, you know, the revolving loan committee. So they made a recommendation um, to extend it. So, you know, made total sense. I did the amortization schedule for them, and, and um, it, you know, it makes sense. So, um, okay. And it's the recommendation of the revolving loan fund committee. So they've already met with, you know, the Crowleys and done the heavy lift. Yep. Okay, unless anybody has any issues with that, just need a motion to approve the modifications to the revolving loan fund for Crowley and Gonzalez. So moved. Moved. That was Lindley and Dave. Dave, okay, thank you. Dave moved it, Lindley seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Reason through them. Yeah, and Jamie's here. All right, I didn't see anything in my box. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so we've just been uh, going through some motions here, uh, Jamie, while we were waiting. Um, so uh, just wanted to thank you for coming on this evening. <clears throat> and maybe we'll just, uh, we'll get you caught up a little bit, Jamie, on last time our discussion um, uh, that came up and um uh we we had uh, during the public comment uh period we were talking about um you know right now with the real estate market what it is and um you know people from out of state or out of community are coming into the community to buy up homes and it was brought to our attention uh, in regards to uh, you know a couple of potential buyers that um had frowned upon some of the latest um, education testing um, in the area on, you know, maybe committing to buy a home here. So, um, which was kind of, a, a lot of it was kind of, um, you know, I wouldn't say surprising news, but new news to us. So um, rather than uh, kick the can, we decided to reach out, see what, uh, I know you're in a new, uh, for anybody that doesn't know Jamie, he's the superintendent of schools for White River Valley. And uh, I believe you're just what, about a year now? So fairly new, so he's only, you know, just getting his feet wet. Um, so we wanted to reach out to Jamie and say, hey, you know, um, not really to put you on the spot or make you defend yourself, just kind of, you know, hey, what's going on at the school level? What's coming down the pipeline? What are you guys working on? Um, I'm sure the test scores are not, you know, nothing that, uh, that were shocking, you know, um, you know, how, how, how are we moving forward to improve them, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, so, um, so that's kind of, kind of where we're at. I mean, we, the other good thing is we don't normally, you know, the town doesn't usually talk to the school and the school doesn't usually talk to the town. And so it's kind of nice to hear, hear something from the school. Um, you know, there probably should be a little bit more communications between the two fronts, but, uh, so, uh, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, I appreciate the invite. And I just, I also want to let folks know you're more than welcome to join our White River Valley meetings. Um, and we have one coming up uh, for the school uh, next Tuesday night. And those are at six, they're virtual via Google Meets. Um, the link's on the agenda and feel free to join us. Um, and so they are on the uh, third Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. Um, and we definitely welcome public and appreciate the, the feedback and comments. So I joined officially um, last March, just prior to the pandemic. I think it was about a week prior um, to school closure. And so uh, I came on full tilt pretty quickly afterwards. And for those of you who don't know me, I grew up in South Royalton on a dairy farm um, and have roots in the area. And so, um, I came here because of what you're discussing is that um, it was clear that we had work to do. Um, the educators here are amazing. They work incredibly hard. And um, what I was looking to do is come on board to say, as a supervisory union, how can we best support our teachers, which then is gonna give them the tools they need to best support our students. Um, and so you're right, the academic data does show that we're not performing at a level that we'd like to be. 
Uh, I'll remind folks that that data is from two springs ago. Um, we didn't have SBAC testing occur um, this last year um, for the, the standardized testing that I think folks are probably referencing, um, which is aligned to the Common Core State Standards and it's called the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. Um, we are testing currently right now across the schools of DSU. So we will have some updated data um, and we're hopeful that we're gonna see a bump even in the midst of a pandemic. And I mentioned that because we do um, our own universal assessments throughout the school year. And we just had the highest literacy scores in the SU that we've had in over five years um, in the face of a pandemic. Are they good enough? Still no, they were only 60% proficient, but they were headed in the right direction, which is good. Um, and so an area that I'm very concerned in um, is mathematics. In general, across the supervisory union, we've not invested in professional development in mathematics, nor resources. Um, and so we're in, we, we did do a full push on literacy that we've been engaged in over the last two years. Um, we're gonna continue our momentum with that. We're actually gonna invest some additional resources with the Stern Center out of Burlington, Vermont around structured literacy. Um, to ensure that our teachers have the tools and expertise they need to provide explicit instruction in phonemic awareness and phonological awareness um, for our students in grades K-1-2. Um, and so you may say, well, Jamie, how are you going to invest in all this work you're talking about? And really, um, the, we have an opportune time. Uh, we're receiving several millions in ESSER funds around COVID relief. And they're going to be earmarked for us in regards to professional development in resources. We will add a few positions across the SU um, to combat the lack of math intervention. Right now, if a student's struggling in math, in the supervisory union, we have very limited access to folks who are highly trained in mathematics, provide explicit instruction in math. Um, so that is an area we're going to look to prioritize across the supervisory union. And for those of you who don't know, I do serve 10 towns. Um, so I serve uh, Granville, Hancock, Rochester, Stockbridge, Bethel, South Royalton, Tunbridge, Chelsea, Sharon, and Stratford. Um, and there's eight schools within those 10 towns. And so what we've seen is, is that um, in general, across the supervisory union, we have significant gaps um, in math abuse. Uh, and it's not from folks not working hard. What we haven't done is a great job of curriculum alignment and consistent expectations um, so that when you walk into a math classroom, you would expect to see um, consistent teaching practices. And right now we haven't even identified those as a supervisory. So that's work that's underway and it will be addressed before next fall um, as well as an investment in our teachers to deepen their content area expertise in math. When you think about uh, elementary teachers, a majority of folks go into elementary education because they love to teach reading and literacy. Um, a few of folks like to teach math too. Um, so what we're looking to do is create some math ambassadors at the elementary level uh, where folks who are interested in deepening their expertise and invest in them in a master's program through VMI, um, the Vermont Math Initiative. Um, to deepen their expertise and then they can become resources for their colleagues. So that works underway. We're continuing to strengthen our social emotional system. We know that we need students who feel connection um, with their teachers so that they're ready and able to learn. Um, and so when I, well, as I talk about uh, the work in core academics, I don't want folks to think that we're taking our eye off of the fact that we need to make sure we're supporting students socially emotionally. Um, and then the other big component for us is um, to ensure that we're continuing to provide rigor around personalized learning. And so across all schools, we're engaged in currently uh, work that's gonna be focused on different types of um, legacy projects and or known as capstones and or known as different uh, passion projects so that we have our students engaging in reading and writing that's informational, but relevant to them so that we can increase the rigor and expectations around that and then really celebrate their learning. 
Um, you know, an area of concern for me too is still written expression. And I think the way that you increase um, demands on written expression is you get students reading and writing about what they're passionate about. And so that works underway as well. And your middle school really is ahead of the curve in regards to that type of work of really tapping into personalized learning um, and looking at the student as an individual and how do we connect uh, reading and writing and rigor and alignment to that. Um, there's still work to be done in different levels of the organization around that, but it's certainly a focus for us. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to say, you know, our big areas of focus is on K-1-2 literacy. We're looking to continue our momentum around literacy in the rest of the grades, but we need to make certain students um, know how to decode um, and really be able to chunk words apart and attack words. And so um, we're gonna make certain that all students get those skills. Um, we're gonna make certain that uh, we're investing in our teachers and our programs. That's something that folks have heard me say if, as you get to know me, and what do I mean by that? I don't believe a program, a book, teaches kids. Teachers teach kids. And so I wanna make certain we're investing in our teachers so that they're experts. So that when a student's struggling, they can, they can use data and information they glean from assessments to inform their practice. Um, and I think you have to be an expert in order to do that. Not just I, research shows it. Um, and so that's an area that we're focusing on as well as just, it's been, as I dug in, it's been several years, um, really over a decade since we had a, a full on attack around math instruction. Um, and so that's something that we're looking to really dedicate our time and resources into as we move forward. And so the ESSER funds, um, are going to be put to work to ensure that we have the resources we need to do that good work um, and then to invest in our faculty and staff. And uh, another area that we re recognize that we have not done a great job in is training all staff so that we have consistent language. So our paraprofessionals are going to be engaged in PD um, on a regular basis too, starting next year. Um, if you look at the calendar that came out from the SU for next school year that was adopted by the SU board, you'll see that there are two half day PDs every month. And that's so we can make certain that we're providing explicit uh, professional development for staff that's um, keyed into folks in regards to whether or not they're supporting students in reading, math, or social emotional. Um, and those folks will engage in that, those PD strands. Um, you know, I let the principals know that I was coming here. I want you to know the principals are working incredibly hard um, to meet the needs of the community and to ensure that our students um, are growing. You know, as I think about regression and recovery plans, I'm proud that we've been in school five days a week since September 8th. Um, we're one of the few, I don't know if folks realize that, uh, minor minority across the state. It's up over 60% still that are still in hybrid mode. Um, and our middle and high school will be back to a full five days a week after April vacation. We also did implement um, our own fully staffed virtual learning academy. So our students in grades K through 12 have WRVSU licensed teachers. We did not subcontract that instruction out. That instructions come from our own. Um, and we've been able to do this all while addressing um, some major debt, as you know. And so I think you'll be pleased as you start to look at the 2021 audits, you're gonna see that we have surpluses in our district and at the supervisory union. Um, and that I fully expect that by the end of next year, that we'll have almost all of that debt paid off without having to come back to taxpayers to address it um, while filling academic gaps. And so there's been good work done. Um, I think my educators are incredibly tired. Um, those of you who do know me, some of you do, like Lisa taught for me. Um, I won't apologize for having incredibly high standards and expectations um, and do know that that's definitely the case. I hold myself to a high standard and certainly hold the staff to a high standard. And then Lee's smiling too. Um, we don't get second chances with students and our students that are in our classrooms in front of us deserve our best and that's what we're gonna give them, um, at least during my tenure. So I'm happy to be here, I'm having a blast. I've been, uh, I feel incredibly supported by the communities and um, thanks again for inviting me tonight. I can take questions, Chris, if folks have any. Sure, yeah, and I just want to say, you know, I, I think it's great. I mean, I've been on, well, on the longest tenure on the board now, 
um, not toot my own horn, but you know, five years, long time. Um, you know, but you know, I don't think we've ever, and Lisa's, you know, been with me as, as long as I've been here. And, you know, we've never really had any um, real outreach from the schools, nor have we outreach to the school. Um, you know, it's kind of a two identities that don't talk. Um, so I think it's, it's really exciting. And, um, you know, I wanted to kind of thank uh, uh, Thomas and Leonard for kind of bringing the question up last time, not to put you guys on the spot, but it was a fair question. And, um, and instead of just, um, you know, giving an answer, you know, we've decided to, hey, I don't know, let's, let's ask uh, somebody that knows. Um, I will say that, you know, I do have kids at the school and um, I'm never um, bashful to let the school know what I think. I think everybody knows that. But at the same time, I do want to, I was going to point out that, you know, that a majority of the schools are not back to, um, you know, in-person learning uh, five days a week, which is, you know, I think all of us parents would like to see our kids at school all the time. But there's a lot of schools that are still at distance learning, which, you know, um, uh, so I kind of wanted to thank the school for, uh, you know, trying to trying to get through this and be in person as much as we possibly can. Um, so. so Chris, I see Lindley and Thomas and Leonard both have their hands up. Sure, we'll, we'll let Thomas and Leonard go first means they had the questions last time. Um, I just wanted to say, um, number one, and I didn't say that the last time very clearly, uh, I have a amazing amount of respect for teachers. Uh, the the work that teachers do, the amount of hours they're putting in, personal time, et cetera, it's, it's, it really baffles me every time I hear stories and I see stories about teachers. So, I mean, really, really thank you to all the teachers. Um, thank you, Jamie, for coming here tonight. I think that's a step in the absolutely right direction because I think it's very important that the town talks to the school and the school talks to the town. Uh, keep the conversation open because we are we are one town our kids uh, for those who have kids go to school here um, and so it, it's important in in the sense of equality you know because uh, kids who don't learn and kids who don't uh, have knowledge they can't go anywhere in this world these days so uh, what what you said Jamie m makes me really hopeful you know to go into the future with with the schools and i know that the past year with COVID and everything has been a huge challenge to everybody and um thank you for that as well put it pulling everybody through i was wondering if i could maybe uh get uh lauren's opinion i saw she's in the call uh, about what she heard tonight uh, because she has two kids and one of them is soon going to be in in elementary school, so uh, I don't know if, if she wants to talk about it. I'm, I'm putting her on the spot here, but so I was just wondering. Uh, yeah, I can say a word without um, my uh, my video is not on because my kids are crazy. Um, but yeah, I um, Jamie, thank you so much for um, just such a concise summary of all of the work that you've been doing and the school district and the teachers, um, obviously it's amazing. Um, and I had a fantastic conversation also with Lindley today, um, just about all of the work that has been going on. So um, it's awesome to be a part of the school district here. Thank you. I'll just add your, uh, if I could, Chris, in my letter, when I applied for my position here as the superintendent, I spoke to the fact that one of the reasons I applied is because I think that the 10 communities I represent really have never leveraged um, what, they, what they could be as towns in regards to bringing young families to those towns. We have 89 run th right through most of our communities. Um, you can get to Montpelier, you can get to the Upper Valley. And I do believe that one of the things that stood in the way was us not promoting what we were doing well as an educational system and celebrating those successes and not addressing our shortcomings. And so it, I did, um, I committed to that when I came aboard and know that our strategic plan or what I call our roadmap for success is all focused on just that, 
because these communities should be thriving based on where we're located geographically. And we, we have school choice in many of the towns. We have an opportunity at the White River Valley High School to try to recruit from our school choice towns. If we get this right, we could really lay out a sustainable plan. Um, and so do know that I take that seriously and understand that that's a big part of my position. And I think that Lindley, did you have something? And before Lindley goes, we just want to put in a plug just to make sure that the budget for the wood shop is increased. Um, but other than that, we'll let Lindley speak. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. We didn't coordinate that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, Jamie, I really appreciate um, just how how well you addressed the the sort of larger picture. Um, I I appreciated hearing it, even though I know bits and pieces of it. It was really nice to hear the whole thing. Um, I actually just wanted to say a little positive thing, which is that um, one of our eighth graders just won a state won third place in a statewide essay writing competition, and it was actually it's Doug's granddaughter, and so. It's yeah. really all Doug. Mm -hmm. He's pulling his weight here. Uh, but no, it's, it's just a testament that we have students entering statewide competitions and and achieving recognition in them. So it's it's there. And I agree with Jamie that it really is. We've just got to get word out in a more you know extensive way so people know what cool stuff we're doing. But thank you, Jamie. Yeah, and, and I think that we actually had. Uh, the first and second place finisher in the um, Vermont science, uh, math, uh, science, math and science fair as well last week. And we'll, we're, look, we're getting a press release out about that too. <clears throat> Supervisory meeting. Sounds good. And I, and I, I'll say from, you know, being here, um, my family moved here in 2006. Um, you know, and, and I guess what I've seen over the years is, and everybody probably can vouch for it here, is, you know, just a, a pretty inconsistency of not just the school here, but the supervisory union. You know, we've seen a lot of faces. We've seen, um, you know, a lot of heartbreak when it comes to um, deficits. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of teachers come and go. So I, you know, hopefully, you know, through your leadership, we'll see more consistency and more you know, long-term buy-in um, at the school system. Chris, it looks like Jean and Thomas and Leonard have their hands back up. Okay, uh, Jean, why don't you go? I just, uh, a question. Uh, we hear stories about uh, inadequate education being conducted this year all over the country because of COVID. Uh, remote learning and so on and so forth. I have a grandson who continues with the virtual academy, uh, and uh, aren't just I'm just curious as to whether you think we're keeping up or how far back we're being set by the COVID uh, crisis. It's a great question, Gene. Uh, it's good to see you again. I think I saw you on an early community forum I had back in the fall, maybe. Um, is that true? I think so. Maybe not. Um, so the what I what I would say is is that there's a reason we're pushing toward in-person learning for next fall. And what we found is is if the students have significant support, and I'm talking about elementary students, significant support at home that our students have been growing. And we've got lots of data points to measure that. We've seen a, a full year's growth with some students. But if students don't have that support and in, intensity of support at home, that at best we've been able to stop them from having regression. But there is regression because they're not growing a full year, right? We've just held them where they were. Um, and so that's a worry of mine. It's, I put a plea out to folks um, in my last weekly correspondence with families that I really hope they consider using our five week uh, summer program. We're gonna provide intervention and explicit instruction in core academics for students. Um, and part of that is to try to address that regression, but to also ensure our students don't fall back over the summer months um, for those students that wouldn't be able to address the achievement gap. So, we're gonna invest a great deal of resources uh, in that. We're gonna have um, 
20 licensed teachers who are going to be providing explicit instruction in those throughout my eight schools um, across the SU. So that's pretty exciting. And we're going to earmark um, some of our recovery funds to do that work because it's important work. But we will be back fully in person in the fall, Gene, because I do worry about that. There's some students who have not been in our buildings for over a year. And, um, you know, the inequity is, is that not all those students have the same support at home. And what we found with virtual learning is without the support at home um, that we can't meet the needs. Um, so I do have some students that I'm concerned about in that regard. And uh, some families are trying to bring them back, um, which is just a great thing. Yeah, thank you. I I, I am his uh, sensei, sensei <laughs> here monitoring his uh, making sure that he gets what he needs here. Okay. Well, well I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I don't have children in the school, but I am a citizen of this town. Um, and I worry about the growth of children and the learning of children and all of that. Um, what I want to know and what I want to eventually talk to you about is how do we get the community to, so, to support the school more? How do we rally this? What, can, what devices can we use to get this community, the people in this community, me, parents, non-parents, you know, to really come together and support what you're doing and support the kids outside of school for this, for learning? Um, is, it, is it like a community center can be started? Think that we can maybe think about to build that? Well, I think we're all, I think we need to do a better job of reaching out and looking at uh, volunteers to get them in our buildings um, because many hands make light work. I also look at, I think we have a lot of folks and I look in front of me who are experts in dis different areas and fields. And as I start to talk about legacy projects and passion projects, having community volunteers that are willing to mentor a student um, so that the student can learn about that expertise that that person has. I think it's another connection for our student. Um, we know it's all about relationships. And then what I have experienced from my time working um, at the Williamstown schools, where at one point we were in the bottom 3% of the state, and then we moved to the top third, is that when we had students engaged in something that they were passionate about, we were able to increase rigor and expectation, uh, Leonard. So that's an area as we look to start to engaging in more of that work, I know we need to build community partnerships because you all have expertise that our students need to be engaging with. Um, and so we're gonna be looking to build that menu of different options for students as we go into next fall and really look to capitalize that the following school. Does the SU currently have a mentoring program in place? I've seen one advertised on Front Porch Forum. I think the Brookfield Librarian, I'm not sure if she works for you or another district, organizes the mentoring program. Owen's got his hand up. We do not have a formal mentoring program. And it maybe we did prior, but of course, COVID put a kibosh to that. Yeah, certainly. Um, well, I, I, know, I know the high school before it, you know, when it was here in Bethel. Well, actually, right as it was transitioning, the high school here had started a, I don't want to say a placement program. It was kind of kind of, kind of between an internship and a placement program for juniors or seniors to be able to, like you were saying, get that passionate career that they're looking at and maybe spend some time at the veterinarian clinic or the GW plastics or, you know, and we had that going. And I don't know if it's still going or not because I'm not as uh, as connected with the high school now, the high schools in Royalton. Um, but is that is those things still happening, Jamie? Yeah, Chris, they have a community-based learning coordinator. Um, and we also budget for a pathways coordinator that can help facilitate students who want to do individualized and personalized learning and connect it to experiences out within the community for proficiency. Um, what we don't have are benchmarks that say, you're going to complete that type of learning experience at the end of eighth grade. You're going to have to do a senior uh, project like Randolph has, for example, that really puts on a demonstration of learning and you kind of defend your work. That's a direction we're looking to head to. Um, because I, I think that that type of rigor is good for everyone. And it's, it's the type of skills that 
you all as business owners want to see our students have, right? You want us to th think creatively. You want us to demonstrate grit. Um, you want students to have effective uh, expression, both in written and oral. Um, those, are the, those are the predictors of success um, in post-secondary pursuits. So those are the things we need to start engaging our kids in more. And we have, yeah. unfortunately, we only have our minutes. Maybe we can take another question or two. Um, but before we do that, Jamie, I just want to know your thoughts on, you know, and keeping the communications open between the school and the town, um, you know, how, how would we best, you know, going forward, do that is, I know, and sometimes we've offered, um, um, you know, quarterly check-ins where either somebody from our board will check in at the school meeting or vice versa, where either yourself or you know, maybe Owen or Andrew would check in with us. Um, do, you, do you think that something like that would be beneficial or? I would love to allow um, teachers and admin to come quarterly. One of the things that we're launching at the, um, at the school district boards are celebrations of learning. Every month where teachers and students will display their learning. Um, and so what I would also say though to folks is, my door is always open. Uh, if you reach out to me and you email and you want to engage in, you know, how can you support the school um, and or what's occurring in the school, please don't be hesitant to reach out. Um, but I would also welcome opportunity to come quarterly. Um, and then again, I invite you to come to our meetings as well on the third Tuesday of the month. Okay. I think we, uh, Paul had his hand up. Yeah, just, just a quick comment. I mean, I, I've never had kids in the school system. And so from my point of view, a lot of the folks that I chat with, they concentrate a lot on the budget issues over the past several years, and they forget to, about the positive things that are happening. So it was really great for you to come along, Jamie, and and put more emphasis on the, th on the good things that are happening. Uh, you know, our tax dollars, the, the bulk of our tax bill is it goes towards supporting our school system. And it's great to see the positive things that are that are coming out of it. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is ask you about, you know, we hear a lot on the news about the isolation that's happening with kids that are totally involved in virtual learning, not being out with their peers and some of the effects, the mental effects, the emotional effects that are taking place on the younger kids especially, but also on the high school kids. Uh, there's specific programs that you folks are working to develop that may help to address some of those uh, situations? So Paul, our um, Virtual Learning Academy um, administrator, Lindy Stetson, um, so we, we devoted admin to that. Uh, she's also the Stockbridge and Rochester principal. Her team of teachers, her and her staff and teachers have been great with trying to make certain we're connecting students um, on a daily basis. But if, if they fall through the cracks, we've been setting up meetings with their home school and having conversations around, does it make sense for them to re-enter back to in-person? Um, and some students have. But we know that we still have students who have it. And so one of the things too that we've done is with our recovery funds, we're trying to strengthen our relationship with the Claire Martin Center. Um, they really are a regional mental health hub. And so we are looking to contract for six school-based clinicians for the next two years um, to provide therapeutic supports for our students across our schools. Um, and those folks will, the funding mechanisms connected to Medicaid, but we're able to get um, full-time employees who can serve our students therapeutically for um, a really significant decrease in regards to funds. It's under 40,000. Um, and so it makes sense for us to invest in that work um, when we look to making certain we're addressing our students' uh, social, emotional health and wellness. Um, and those will, be, our recovery funds will be earmarked to that. That won't be coming from the taxpayer. Um, and so we are looking to put that in place for next school. We have, uh, we have ads up right now, actually. If you were to go to the Claire Martin site, um, the issue we have is finding qualified folks. So we do have a school-based clinician in place already. 
Um, and I'm remaining optimistic that we'll have that number of six come the, no later than the fall. I'll, uh, any, unless any of the board members have any other questions, I'll let Owen, I saw his hand up, I'll let him be the last public comment on it. Um, so go ahead, Owen. Hey, thank you so much, Jamie. You are awesome. And I've heard from so many parents in the district that it's been a really significant, noticeable shift in your leadership. And people are just really excited about you. So like, thank you for being awesome <laughs> um, and being an awesome leader. Um, my question is really, again, an offering of support. I have been in touch with Lisa Floyd, um, but before you join this call, just so you know, some of us are um, inaugural members of an equity and inclusion committee that was inspired by some of the activism that happened last year. And also, honestly, um, the letter that your district um, sent acknowledging that equity and inclusion is important in our schools. And we really want to match what the school is doing with what the town is doing and vice versa. Um, so I, I, we've reached out to Lisa Floyd and offered um, if there's any way that our equity and inclusion committee can be supportive to y'all in your efforts around equity and inclusion. And I just wanted to say that to you as well. Thanks, Owen. Um, as you saw the Herald covered, uh, we are uh, very close to releasing our third draft of our anti-racism policy. Um, I'm still hopeful of adoption for that in June. Mm -hmm. um, and what the boards decided is that we are going to have a set of policies under equity the category equity. So, um, you know, feel free to join our policy committee meetings. Um, and those are on the, uh, you guys know what I do every night now. I have a meeting. Uh, those are the fourth Thursday of the month at six. And those will continue to be virtual so we can make certain we get participation across the SU. We found that our participation's up. We may start to move back to some in-person meetings soon at the district level, but the committee and SU level meetings will continue to be virtual awesome cool thank you well we love we would love to be a resource to you and we're excited to learn from you and the kiddos as they're going to teach us things <laughs> so thank you thank you so unless anybody on the board has any further questions for jamie um i just wanted to thank you for your time this evening definitely have been more than helpful um you know, I think it is important that, uh, you know, that the town and the school establish a, a stronger relationship. Um, so any way of, you know, uh, maybe I'll have Therese reach out to, um, to you or your office. Um, maybe we could put together like a quarterly drop in where you can, we'll invite you. Uh, it maybe doesn't necessarily have to be you, Jamie, maybe it could be Owen or Andrew or somebody else that could drop in and, you know, maybe give us a lowdown on what's happening in the school or what you might need for help coming or, um, and vice versa. Um, you know, we'd be more than happy to drop into one of your meetings as well. So. Hey, thank you all so much. That would be great. I'd love that opportunity. If you have anything you want the select board to have, Jamie, just email me. Obviously, you and I have exchanged emails now. So just send me an email if there's something you want the board to have or you want us to put out on our Facebook page, website, Super. or something to promote, just send it along to me and I'll, I'll get it out there for you. That would be great. Thank you. You're yeah, we're looking at how do we do a better job communicating. So uh, that it's would be hard. I know we do it. It's, it, you struggle. <laughs> it's tough. All right. Unless we have anything further, uh, thank you, Jamie, for attending this evening. Have a thank good night, you. everyone. You thank too. You. Thank you, Jamie. Hey, uh, any further discussion in regards to the school end of things that didn't seem like we had any other. So we will move along, get right back into the fun stuff. So I tried to set up the <laughs> licenses so you could do it in one yeah. motion. I see that. <laughs> and I was just kind of looking through all the different licenses here to make sure that they were what we have them on here as. Yeah. But we do have um, Locust Creek Store with a second class license. Um, 
And then Sambor Enterprises with second class, Creek House Diner, first class, and Tessie's Tavern, first class and third class licenses. Yeah, I don't know when they're reopening that. I don't know, um, but obviously they are. And um, I haven't heard exactly when yet, so. So unless anybody has any objections, I uh, just need a motion to approve those licenses. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Dave, second by Paul. All in favor? Aye. So well, I'm just gonna let have... you know, tomorrow there'll be a clipboard at the back door <laughs> for you guys. So you'll have to come in and sign all of these mm -hmm. um, liquor licenses. Thank Thanks for the reminder. I do have a question about the form. Okay. Um, there is a line that talks about uh, training or... Um, yep, there is. And I notice different dates. What's the, is there an expectation or requirement that there be training within a certain period of time? I don't know what the dead, what the date is, but yes, the liquor control, anyone who serves alcohol, whether you're a bartender or you work at a convenience store, then the person who's selling the alcohol has to have training. And I don't know what the DLC rule is, whether it has to be within, you know, two years or what, but, and it may differ for bartenders versus retail. I don't know, but there is, and that's why the DLC puts that on there. They're the ones that follow that. They have to have training before they ever serve anyone. They cannot serve without a training. Right, but don't they have to, you also have to keep it up, right? It's not one and done. Every two years, yep. Oh, so it's two years, Jean. Thanks, Owen. Okay. All right. And we had our local emergency management plan so this is something that we update every year. Kelly and Dave Aldrigetti and I did it obviously this year because of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. Just making sure that all the information was still up to date. Um, that is something that um, we, buy, we have to have done every year and adopted by May 1st. So um, Chris, you need, I have to sign it because I had taken, I've taken you know, multiple ICS trainings. So um, I sign it one place and you sign it in another. So it would be a motion to adopt and authorize my signature. Yes. Okay. Need a motion for that. So moved. Okay, moved by Paul, second by Dave. All in favor? Okay. Aye. Aye. And I, I have another question going back to uh, the Sambor liquor license. They did not indicate that it, they did not answer two questions. One about uh, criminal activity or motor vehicle expense and elective or appointed state county. Those questions are not answered on that form. Well, the good news is it goes to the DLC. So if the liquor control wants more information than the, what they have on file, then they will reach out to um, Dave or Bill and, and make them comply. Okay. Yeah, the liquor licenses are always kind of an odd one, Gene, because you, you know. I, I, I know it goes on to the board, but. Yeah. I, yeah, I was just curious that they hadn't answered those two things. Well, yeah. the thing that's more curious is actually the state of Vermont generates the liquor licenses. Yeah. And it sends them to the town clerk and then the town clerk forwards them. So this is their information. So yeah. I don't know, we're, we're a little out of the loop sometimes, I think. Okay. And then we had, um, uh, discussion in regards to commercial trucks on Camp Brook, Bethel Mountain Road. So I was reached out to by Frank Severy. He is a select board member in Rochester, and he and I have had a phone conversation or two and, and exchanged several emails. So um, he has reached out, and I reached out as well. So we've reached out together, I guess you could 
say to DMV um, regarding, you know, the commercial trucks on Camp Brook. Obviously, I placed a new sign at the base of Camp Brook last year saying this is not a truck route and it's a little salt area, et cetera, et cetera. So aside from spike strips and a neon sign, it's hard to keep <laughs> tractor trailers off that hill. So I actually went on the federal website and found contact information for Garmin, um, MapQuest, Google, you know, all these people to try to get Bethel Mountain off the map zone for trucks. And actually a very nice gentleman from MapQuest reached out to me and said, here's the problem. The problem is everybody uses the same maps and no one has developed a truck route app yet. So they don't even have the ability to really flag that and say it's not a truck route. So he said they're developing it, currently working on developing something like that. But of course, it's all about money. So we spoke to the DMV about putting more signage where people should be going on Route 100, Route 107, so that trucks can get the signage before Bethel Mountain to say, oh, this is where I should have gone. Mm -hmm. And then we also, uh, Frank's question was, besides weight limit, because if you pull a truck over for weight limit, two things have to happen. One is the officer who pulls them over has, has to attend truck training, which is right. usually about a week or two. So if mm -hmm. they, they're not truck certified, it's a no go. The other thing is too, yeah. we don't have scales. So right. it's, you know, sometimes you have it's to expensive. look at what the load slips are and go from there. So mm -hmm. Frank's question was, can we make Bethel Mountain a, a link or an axle, a number of axles or links? So we're waiting for some response from DMV. We also asked them for a plan for, you know, better signage. So whether mm -hmm. or not the state <clears throat> to sign their routes to make it more obvious to people that they right. should be up there. Um, the other, the other option thought I had was once we come up with a plan for this, maybe trying to get vendor lists from local businesses who we know put, you know, not necessarily the local business, but whoever their vendors are, who they buy from, maybe get their vendor list and we could send them all letters saying, Hey, FYI, stop going over there. Here's your better, you know, better route. <laughs> So we'll see how it goes right now. Um, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic that the state will at least give us some assistance with, you know, signage and, and things. And I also reached out to the 911 board. So just kind of a quick update. Um, Frank did ask me about a traffic ordinance. And I said, yes, it would need to be in your traffic ordinance. He wanted ours. And I said, no, you don't. Ours mm -hmm. needs to be updated. So um, we're going to wait and, you know, when I hear from DMV and, we get some good ideas i'll let you know but that's currently yeah. what we're doing and i've been in contact with susan banis from rochester she lives on the you know the base the other thing too i realized was they were asking me saying oh well you're bethel you guys have a constable i forgot rochester got rid of their constable because yeah. of the money so i yeah, have to remind frank the next time we chat that maybe they ought to put money for a constable back in there <laughs> So that's where we stand with that. Still doing some research and working with Frank. Well, but it's nice to be collaborating with another town. Right. Well, as Stowe knows, you could put a big blinking, flashing sign at the bottom of it, and the truck drivers will still drive up the mountain, right? I know. It's ridiculous, so. really. I mean, it, you know, at some point, common sense is just should come into play to say, well, you know. <laughs> I mean, Doug is retired nowadays, so he could just stand watch from us <laughs> yeah, sorry. sit at the bottom when he sees him. them come and he can flag him down tell him to turn around i tried that it don't work yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big flag out said turn around turn around and and that's the and that's the sad thing nowadays is truck drivers well not just truck drivers but drivers in general we're so keyed on our gps device that even though you know you may have advanced warning signage up like maybe on 100 it says okay trucks need to go this way they won't even see it they drive right by them because they're so fixated on the route that they're traveling you know and uh yeah. until, uh, they get to a point where they get stuck you know exactly and then we go out and we have the same you know rochester has the same problem you get calls in the night because somebody's mm -hmm. up there etc but yeah you know, say the words Rand McNally and people think you got six heads. We're like, yeah, back in the day, you know, when I came over on the Mayflower, mm -hmm. we used to, you know, right. we had maps. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. What's a map? <laughs> I know. So we're trying to work it out and uh, we'll yeah. see if we can come up with maybe the state will be some 
of assistance, maybe not, but yeah, we're trying. Is, is either on either side of Bethel Mountain, is there a grade? Uh, should we be, should the grade be posted? Um, uh, like uh, going into uh, Barry. I know what you uh, mean. I know. I don't know. I think so, Jean. But honestly, I you know, and I was just up there on Friday too. I just can't remember. But I think so. But I'll I'll have to double check. But that could be part of what DMD recommends. But right now we have a I have a big huge orange sign at the base that says this is not a truck route. You, you right. know, not a GPS route. It's a low salt area. Use Route 107. Not that. Right. So uh, right. I, I don't know. I'll I'm just. Check. I'll check, Jean. Yeah, I, 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 that that might be a a question to to ask mm -hmm. whether it should be grade advised and yeah. whether it's even possible to put an unsafe for trucks yeah i don't know i'm hoping that they'll because uh, all signage has to adhere to mutcd standards right so yeah. we'll see what hopefully the dmv will lay out a plan and be helpful so we'll see um, but anyways, I just want to waste any more time. I just wanted to let you know I'm working on it. And it was nice to hear from Frank, yeah. you know, someone from Good. Rochester reaching out to us. It's nice to partner with another town with the same problem. <laughs> so, yeah. Did we get any pushback from the state with the fact that we're getting paid for a class two road? No. I was say we're getting paid for the trucks to use that, be able to use that road. That's oh, a I see what you're <clears throat> saying. No, I mean, we get paid diddly for the class two roads in Bethel right. anyways. So it costs us more to maintain that road than any, you know, they've said. But no, I don't know. I'm like I said, I haven't had a conversation yet with the DMV because they haven't gotten back to us. So, mm -hmm. but I don't think so. They were, we'll see what they say, Dave. No one said anything to me so far. And one of the, someone from the state helped me with the wording of the sign that I put at the base. So yeah. we'll see. We'll push back, Dave, because they don't give us near enough money to maintain that beast. No, we should never have taken that thing to begin with. Very true. Amen. It should still be a state road. <laughs> All right. Town manager's report. Anything left there, Therese, that we didn't... Uh... The only thing is the... Um, okay, yep, I guess I put that in there about the hazard mitigation plan. So mm -hmm. um, I finished... Well, I say I finished. I got through it today, sent it to the state. Um, the lady there at the state, Stephanie Smith, is being very good. She's going to review it for me. This is a monster, and um, it should have been done two years ago, frankly. But we're getting it done. It's what helps us keep our ERAF from 25 right. to 12. So I sent it to the state today, but we'll talk about it at a future meeting. I just made a copy of it and put it in your box today. And um, mm. so, and I sent it out today to all the local towns. You have to send it to Brantree, Randolph, Stockbridge, Barnard, Roch. I'm Chester. I had a guy from Barnard call me. He's like, "Why did you send me this?" <laughs> and uh, so you're anyway, telling me he's a 25 percent town. <laughs> yeah. Well, he said to me, he "Goes well, I'm going to be updating this." And I said, <laughs> "Tell me you got a grant because we needed ours done sooner, so we couldn't yeah. qualify for the grant." And he said he did. I said, "Good." I said, "If you need anything." Let me know because it's a beast. And um, but as we know, it's well worth have you know well oh, the twelve and a half percent. You deduction. better believe it is. You better believe it is. So yeah. yeah. So the only um, yeah. So there was some stuff in your um, the other thing was, and I had mentioned this earlier about Sand Hill. Obviously, we didn't get one grant. Um, we got better connections. We did not get the transportation alternatives. But then you see the community project funding request. So I'm hoping. Maybe Welch mm -hmm. will earmark, you know, yeah, hundred thousand. That uh, two rivers, the progress report, and then you saw my questions to Tori and how she answered those. Um, the cruiser has been marked finally, so there's a picture of that. And um, also, finally, um, was able to connect with Trini at the state after I talked to someone else at the state. Gave me your number, and it looks like. We're actually going to be able to get that graffiti painted. So, saved us like six, eight thousand dollars. They wanted to charge us an arm and a leg, the railroad. But so, I think we should just put a big paint it in, put a big frame around it, and leave a sticky note that says, "If you're going to tag this, at least put something tasteful. We'd prefer a landscape or something, because as soon as it's, it's going to be 
going to be done again. So Probably, we'll, unfortunately. We'll leave a note and say what we want. Do we have an ETA on the water guys coming back? May. Yep, they're going to start some preliminary work, obviously, before that behind the scenes, but they'll be back on this in the street, I think, the first week of May. And around what, there. what did they have left for work? Was it a month or two? Or um, I think they're like a month and a half. Yep. So they'll go from, um, <clears throat> excuse me, from the post office uh, up past, just up past Bethel Mills. Not very far. I know there's a rumor. People think we're doing the entire North Main Street, and I'm sorry to say we are not. Right. And there's a Bethel, our first Bethel Connections meeting, grant meeting is tomorrow. And for that grant that we were awarded, so. That's it. Oh, I just want to remind you, so we're meeting Monday, remember? So Monday we're meeting, and then apparently we sort of desire meeting Wednesday, but Monday you have to bring all your comp time and give it to Lindley because it'll be her birthday. So Chris promised her comp time. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll see. I'll donate, I'll donate a thousand miles. Yeah, we'll pass the hat. <laughs> so when did that happen? Did that happen at our last select board meeting? Yeah. The changing of the, the it did wow, <laughs> oh, man! If you can't make it. At least I can do the minutes. Okay, <laughs> just email me and let me know. Okay, oh, well. <laughs> went right over my head. That's okay. <laughs> That's it, Chris. You're good. Okay. So next up, we had the select board meeting minutes from the 22nd. The only thing I saw, uh -oh. I'm gonna beat Paul the punch, but it says the meeting minutes are for 323, which I believe should be 322. All right, I was probably doing them that day. <laughs> I will make it. Nice catch. So it's 321. All right. 320. No, 22. 322. Oh, sorry. Okay. You had it right. You have it right on the, um, of the, on the agenda, but the meeting minutes themselves say 23rd. Oh, okay. All right. I'll make it up. Anybody else have any changes or are we good to make a motion to approve as amended? Is amended. I move we approve is amended. Second. Moved by Gene, second by Paul. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Ayes have it. And there were a fair amount of other communications in our packets. So hopefully you had a chance to read through all those. As well as the um, the budget. <clears throat> update was in there. I've got a question about one of the um, transfer station minutes. The okay, I'm not sure I can answer, but I'll try. <laughs> well, maybe Dave or Lindley might might be able to. It's uh, the minutes from March 24th. Uh, it says that the next meeting is going to be on April 10th at 6 p.m. That's a a Saturday. Was that a is that an incorrect date, or did you guys actually meet on a Saturday? No, it's the 14th. That's okay. just correct. It's this Wednesday. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to mention that I did submit an agenda item for that meeting and had some really good positive responses, uh, especially from Jerry um, over in, in um, Royalton. Um, very pleasant. And uh, I've seen... It seems to be a lot uh, nicer air there uh, than we've seen uh, in the past. So I just wanted to throw that out there and compliment. All right. The energy progress report card, uh, does that go to the energy committee? Yes. Yep, and All Nicole right. and I shared an email back and forth about it. All right, because I 
I would I would welcome some conversation or from the committee, especially regarding generation, energy generation, one of the D grades. Yep, she so. um she had though they were here not long ago that she came and, and um, presented to the select board that she's good about checking in. Um, her and I had exchanged about the cars and, and that sort of thing, because obviously that's a lofty goal. I think that's gonna require the state to step in and give further tax credits for people. Um, but yes, she did receive it and um, she emailed me. We, and I'll have to look back at her email, Jean, to see if she commented on that. I know she asked me a question about, oh, I know one of her comments was, Jean, because they only take into consideration generation of power in Bethel. They don't take into consideration the fact that the town is part of a net metering. So she even said, you know, that could look better if they would include um, us participating in a net metering, um, which we do, which we do. So with a solar um, located in another town. So anyways, so it, there's some there's some weak spots to this. That they things they don't take into consideration. Yeah. Well, I and okay. My particular location does not good for solar. Mm -hmm. But if if I were if there were available a community based co op, yep, <laughs> kind of thing uh, that might be attractive to us. Yeah, you might have to reach out to to Green Mountain Power because I know they you know there may be some other net rings that I'm you know that I'm not aware of and to see if you could participate in one okay. to put solar panels on all the the back sides of the buildings the businesses here and then disseminate it across the town there you go because mm -hmm. yeah, I know so that anyway that's obviously... have the have the energy committee look at that that's all yeah we have the hydro you know obviously Bethel Mills has a you know, generates money from the dam and they sell it back, generates power and they sell it back to GMP. Right. Hey, uh, just a little side note uh, on the cars. Um, I wonder if uh, Nicole would like to look into the fact of how the heck you're going to charge all these cars. We have a weak infrastructure, electrical infrastructure as it is. And you put a bunch more cars out there that I don't know if you realize how much power those cars require if you travel to Montpelier and back every day, you're talking about increasing your electric bill somewhere between $150 and $300 a month. Wow. Yeah. I know that we, I had referenced uh, or asked about, um, you know, the charging stations because there was, Bethel was considering it at a point, I'm not a big fan, frankly, just because once the money, once the grant runs out, it's our problem to deal with this thing. And um, so I had asked Nicole about the state because they built that parking lot and we're supposed to have a ton of um, charging systems. Well, I think they only have the lowest. So it takes, they just have the low ones. Yeah. So now, if you park there, it takes like eight hours. She yeah. said most vehicles, you know, to charge. So well, most vehicles take a full 20 hours. Yeah. So she yeah. was saying, you know, they have different apparent classes of charging stations and they made it sound originally a parking lot was supposed to be full of them and some of the higher speed ones. And that's not what they ended up putting in. No, nope. they put in, uh, I think they're like a level one where I think that's what she said. I there. believe it's either level two or three are the fast charging yeah. um, ones, but obviously cost a lot more. Um, yep. Yeah. 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 I, I don't see, I, I, I look all the time and I go through there and I, I, I have yet to see somebody hooked up to one. Yeah, I mean, there's a, that's a crazy, what are they going to do, sit there down off the interstate for six hours and charge their car? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if they, if they park there and go to work right. and the state isn't charging them, what the heck, if you're gone eight, nine hours, you get a little something. That's right. right. True. Yep. You'd think if they were the one with the electric car, they'd be the one driving, Dave. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> Yeah, right. Huh, that's fine. So I'm not sure, but. So any other business to come before the board before we enter into executive session? Looks like everybody has gone to bed for the night. Mm -hmm.
Doug's getting ready to. Yep, yep I am on my way out. Good night, guys. Bye, hey, Doug. Doug. Take care. You too. All right. So, Therese, do you want to do us the... Um, oh, sure. Reading us into this executive same, session means you put the paragraph together. Same thing we're going to do we did last time. So we're to discuss the interlocal contract for operation of the Bethel Royalton Solid Waste Management Facility per 1 BSA 313A1. This is eligible for discussion in executive session as it is the start of a possible contract negotiation and the town of Bethel does not wish to disclose its negotiation strategy and premature general public knowledge puts us at a disadvantage. Okay. So we need a motion to enter executive session to discuss the town's current contract with the town of Royalton for joint operation of the transfer station. So moved. <laughs> by Dave. Dave. Second. Second by Paul. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Have a good night, Lisa. And Teresa will boot Orca. Oops. I thought I did. Hang on.